Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth lecture in our Measure Theory and Functional Analysis course brought to you by quantumformalism.com. Today, we are going to talk about outer measures. And outer measures are going to be a method in which we can take something that's a little weaker than a measure, like we talked about last time, and build it into a measure. So let's get started. So our topic is outer measures. And the basic idea of an outer measure is going to be sort of like this. We'll pretend we're just in R2 for the time being. And suppose we have some set that we want to measure. And we sort of doesn't really matter how, break up R2 into a bunch of, we'll say Borel sets for the sake of this picture. It doesn't necessarily have to be that. But the idea of an outer measure is to find a way to contain this blue set E in these Borel sets. It's going to be an overestimate. So we take some Borel sets that will seal off this set E here that I've doodled sort of as such. And the outer measure of E will somehow be uh, dependent on what these Borel sets can close off. And the idea is we're going to look at these overestimates and we're going to try and take the smallest or the infimum of these overestimates and that will tell us how to actually measure E. So let's actually get right to our first definition. An outer measure on a non-empty that x is a function which we will write as mu star from the power set of x to our usual interval 0 to infinity, satisfying the following conditions. One mu star of the empty set is zero. Okay, that's standard for a measure. We want that to be the case. Two, mu star of A is gonna be less than or equal to mu star of B if A is a subset of B. Now this ends up being, we proved last time, a property of measures but we're just going to actually define this as part of a property of an outer measure. And outer measures will also satisfy subadditivity. That's u star of some union of sets, say from j equals one to infinity, is less than or equal to the sum of mu star of the AJ. Again, you might recognize these as properties of measures, but we're going to define an outer measure to just already have these. And then later we'll show that under the right conditions, you can build from this into a measure. And remember, the condition in the definition of a measure is if you have disjoint sets, you get explicit equality. Outer measure doesn't guarantee that you get that explicit equality, but we can build up from here in a way so that we can guarantee that we have that. So how do we do that? Well, we'll start with the following proposition. You will let E be some set or some subset of the power set of X and rho, from e to zero to infinity. 
such that we have the following, such that the empty set is an element of this collection, x is an element of this collection, and our function rho takes the empty set to zero. Then, uh, we will, no, we shouldn't write then, there. Uh, for all A, that subset of X, we will define mu star of A to be the infimum of the sum of rho of Ej where these Ej are elements of our collection and the set A is a subset of the union of the Ej. Then this U star is an outer measure. Okay, so what, what's this actually saying here? We are going to just take some collection of sets of our space X such that it contains the empty set, the whole space, and some function rho. And the only thing that rho has to satisfy is that the empty set goes to zero. And then we're going to define the outer measure of any set A to be the infimum of this function rho over any collection of sets that contains A as a subset. So if we were sort of want to doodle a little picture here. Now let's, let's, we'll call that A. And suppose we have some collection of EJ that covers it. Maybe there's a collection of EJ that its union contains A. And we take the measure of that with respect to whatever this function rho is. But then we say, well, wait, we can find smaller ones. So now let's use a different color here and say we can find a better collection of EJ, maybe something like uh, something like that, which is a smaller collection of EJ that covers A, and it ends up the sum of rho of those EJ is even smaller. So we're going to look for the smallest way that we can cover A in these sets, basically. That's what we're looking for, the smallest way that we can cover A in these sets. And then whatever that ends up being, that's what we'll define to be U star of A, and we're saying that that's going to be an outer measure. So the first thing to note, and it's a simple observation, but an important one, since X itself is an element of our collection, we can cover any A by just letting, You can pick EJ to be X, and since A is a subset of X, obviously this will cover it. So every set A can be covered by the way we defined our collection E. Okay, so with that, let's get to the proof of this. Okay, so what we have to do is we just have to do a definition check here. So we check that the U star defined above satisfies the definition of an outer measure. Okay, so what do we need to check here? Well, we need to check these three things. We need to check that the empty set goes to zero. We need to check that it has this monotonicity property, and we need to check that it has this sub-additivity property. And these first two will be pretty quick and easy. Okay, so first we will just note, 
So the first property, we'll just note that if you just let EJ equal the empty set for all J, then obviously the empty set is gonna be a subset of that union. And since rho was defined to take the empty set to zero, that sum is just zero. So that automatically implies that mu star of the empty set is gonna be zero because it's gonna be the infimum of all these UJs. Uh, I mean, of all these um, uh, row of EJs and the infimum is gonna be zero. So good, that takes care of the first property. So that one wasn't too bad. The next one also isn't gonna be too bad because if A is a subset of B and this union, uh, we have some collection of EJs that covers B, then since A is a subset of B, it's obviously gonna cover A. So what happens here is anything that covers B is also going to cover A. So whatever the infimum of those covers are is going to also cover A. So the me outer measure of A is going to be less than or equal to whatever the outer measure of B is. So, that takes care of that property. So that's easy. Now we have to worry about the uh, subadditivity. And this is where things can get uh, a little bit sticky. So we will let a collection of AJ just be some subset of this power set of X. And we're gonna let epsilon greater than zero, just be arbitrary. So we can find EJ, and we'll superscript it with a K, for each AK such that AK is going to be a subset of that union. And now bear in mind here, just so this double notation isn't too confusing, we're unioning over the J's. The K just denotes that it's a cover for the AK. The K is just denoting that it's a cover for the AK. But we can find it such that A is contained in it. And that the sum of rho of the EJK, we could make it as small as we want because U star of AK is gonna be the infimum. U star of AK is an infimum. So we could make this as small as we want. We can make it a little less than U star of AK plus some really, 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 really tiny number, which we're gonna choose to be epsilon over 2K. And again, that follows from the fact that this is an infimum. So any uh, for any epsilon, you can find the right sets EJK such that rho of the EJK summed together is gonna be just less than the actual outer measure plus a little, little, little extra. Okay. But now with that in mind, we can sum all these together and we'll note that union of these AK, so we're gonna union all those together and we wanna show that it's less than or equal to the sum of the outer measure of the AK. Well, we already know that this is going to be because each AK is covered by these unions of these EJKs, it's gonna be less than the following double sum. So we first do the inner sum is over the Js. 
And this gives us our cover over a k, and then we sum over all the k's. So we're basically summing together row of every element of every cover for each a k. That inner sum we know is less than or equal to, well, we just discussed it above. That, that's what the inner sum is less than or equal to. But now we can just break apart this sum. So this is gonna be the sum of the outer measures of the AK plus the sum of epsilon over 2K. This one converges as we know from calculus. We know that that's going to just equal epsilon. plus epsilon, okay? But epsilon greater than zero was arbitrary. So this is true for all epsilon greater than zero. So that means in particular, we actually just have that this is gonna be less than or equal to just this. So mu star of uh, union of the AK is less than or equal to the sum of mu star of each AK, which gives us our subadditivity. And now we've checked off all three properties of an outer measure. Therefore, we can conclude u star is an outer measure. Ooh. And that finishes that proof. OK, all right. So we've now seen, let's scroll back up here to the statement that given some collection, whoopsies, oops, sorry, bump the screen, that given uh, some collection of sets, ah, here we are, given some collection of sets E, we can define an outer measure on it. Now, where do we go from here? Well, let's talk about first what a outer measurable set or a mu star measurable set is. So we need a new definition. Okay. If mu star is an outer measure on X, a set a subset of X is called new star measurable if we have the following equality. We have that new star of E is equal to new star of E intersect A plus mu star of E intersect A complement for all E in X. Okay, so if we have this equality satisfied, we will call the set A mu star measurable. So what is this actually saying? First, before we talk about uh, where we're gonna go with this, let's sort of talk about what this, this equality means. And I think the easiest way to think about it is first to sort of consider A as a subset of E, because then this is sort of obvious as to what's going on. So you have uh, A here, maybe E contains it like this. Well, then we could see that this above equality is quite obviously true. We have that uh, E intersect A is going to be that region there. And then E intersect A complement is going to be that region there. And we can see that, yeah, that should, at least based on the picture I drew, that should add up and give us this measure of E. And then if you have it the other way around, if A is larger and E is a subset of A, so now A contains E. 
you'll sort of have that E intersect. Uh, well, I mean, you still have the same thing, it adds up. But the idea here is, here A is being approximated from E from the outside. E is approximating from the outside. And this one is saying E is approximating from the inside. And although we're not going to get into it, this is the notion of an inner measure. You can define something like that, just like we did for outer measures. That's the notion that's sort of happening here. And this one's saying that if you break it up into, because no matter what, you're going to have an inside and outside part. doesn't matter if uh, A is a subset or A is contained in, or uh, A is a subset of E or E is a subset of A. You're going to have an outer and inner part of it. And this is just saying that they'll add up and behave as we would expect them to behave. Now, you can cook up some really weird examples here, like uh, using non-measurable sets, sort of like we saw with the Vitali sets or the Binoktarsky paradox, where this definition actually doesn't hold but I'll leave that to you to look up on your own time. We're not gonna get too invested in that. Um, but this is the definition. And the good news is actually one direction of this definition always comes for free. Because, <clears throat> because E intersect A union, E intersect A complement, that's always going to give us E, right? So we have by the sub additive, uh, sub additivity of an outer measure, we actually get for free that the union is going to be less, the measure of the union is less than just the sum of the measures. So we actually for free always get this one direction. Okay, the other direction is the one that if we were to prove something was measurable, we would have to verify. So we can write this. U star measurable, if and only if we have the other direction. If it's greater than or equal to U star E intersect A complement. So if we have the other direction, ooh, that's sort of messy. If we have this other direction, then we know where you measurable and where you measurable, then we have this other direction. And again, we can reduce it to this because this one is always true because of the sub additivity property of an outer measure. So this is the only one we need to check. And in particular, we only need to check it if this is finite, because if that outer measure of E is infinite, then you're always gonna have this. Is obviously just going to be greater than or equal to that. So we only actually need to even check this if we know that mu star V is finite. Okay. And now this definition is what we will use to prove our next big theorem. And now mathematicians are, how to put this delicately, notoriously lethargic. We are a very lazy group of the STEM people. We always try to do whatever we can to make our life as easy as possible. And that's often why when you flip through textbooks, you'll just see sort of a, a disimpassioned list of theorems, definitions, and proofs. So when a mathematician names a theorem, that's going above and beyond. That's putting in extra effort. That means it's important. And this is a named theorem. It is the Carathodori theorem. I'm sure I butchered the pronunciation of that name. 
uh, but it is a named theorem, and it actually is a pretty, uh, we can see from the statement, it's a pretty powerful result. It says if u star is an outer measure on x, then the collection m, I don't want that to be confused with a mu, the collection M of U star measurable sets is a sigma algebra. And the restriction and the restriction of mu star to M is a complete measure. Awesome. So if we have an outer measure, then the collection of mu of mu star of outer measurable sets is automatically a sigma algebra. And then if you just restrict mu star to M, you have a complete measure. Now it's possible mu star might be applicable to sets that are not in the sigma algebra. But we're sort of not caring about that with this theorem. We're just saying as long as you have mu star, then the collection of all outer measurable sets, when you restrict mu star to just that collection, you have a complete measure. Okay, so um, we will prove this, uh, but this is going to be the last theorem that we prove today. We're still going to state a couple more, but this is going to be the last one that we're going to prove today. But since it's such an important one, it warrants a nice proof. And then after this, we'll state a couple definitions and a couple of propositions without proof. But we'll, we'll go through and verify this one. Because again, this is a very powerful result. This tells us that our outer measures can easily build up to measures on a nice sigma algebra defined by whatever sets are already outer measurable. OK, so. The first thing we'll note is, well, what, what does it mean to be a sigma algebra? The first thing we want to do is actually verify that this is a sigma algebra. So what does it mean to be a sigma algebra? Well, there's two conditions. If for any uh, set A and M, we need a complement in M. And if you have some countable collection in M and the union of them is also in M. Okay, well, this one is actually almost free by just what it means to be U star measurable, okay? So if A is in M, then that means A is U star measurable. Okay, so what does U star measurable mean? Well, it means that you have this equality for all E, but just notice, okay, well, you already have A and A complement here. So if A is U star measurable, then A complement is also mu star measurable since A complement complement is A. So you could think of this as A complement complement, and that gives you that A complement is also mu star measurable, but then that means A complement is in M. Cool. So that takes care of that one. That was easy. Woo. All right. This one's going to be a bit more of a journey. It'll require some uh, manipulating sets. Uh, and we're actually going to start by doing this via induction. So we're actually going to first show that just given two sets, their union, two sets in M, then their union is also going to be in M. And then we'll go by induction from there. Okay. So we will now let A and B be in our sigma algebra. And again, our goal is to show 
first that just the union of these two things is in there and then use induction from there to get that any countable union would be in there. Okay. So we will also let E just be some arbitrary subset of X. So then by the definition of U star, by the definition of U star, we have that mu star of E is going to be mu star of E intersect A plus mu star of E intersect A complement. And now you're wondering, well, where does this B come into play? Well, now we're going to hit both of these with both B and B complement. So we're going to actually end up splitting this into the sum of four things. So let me go to a new line to make sure we have enough space. Yeah, right, sort of a little cramped here to try and get it in. We'll have E intersect A intersect B plus mu star of E intersect A intersect B complement. This we know we're going to have the equality here, and it's coming from the definition of a measure or outer measure because the outer measure has to be true for every subset of X. And you can consider this as still a subset, we'll say F, of x. It's still some subset of x, so you'll get that it splits apart this way, but it's going to split apart for both E intersect A and E intersect A complement. So now we have E intersect A complement intersect B plus E intersect A complement intersect B complement. And it looks like we made a massive mess here. And we admittedly did, but we're going to make an astute observation. We will note, and this is always one of the rough things about proofs in mathematics, is you can do everything correct, but you get to here, and without the right observation, you sit there staring at this saying, well, what good does this do us? The observation we're going to make is as follows. A union B... It's actually the union of A intersect B, A intersect B complement, and A complement intersect B. Now we can really easily see that from a picture, so let's doodle a little picture. Here's our happy A, there's our happy B. A union B is the whole thing. Well, this middle part is A intersect B. This part over here is A intersect B complement. And this little part over here is a complement intersect B. And we see if we union those three regions together, we just get A union B. But now this observation plus the subadditivity of an outer measure is what's going to let us rewrite this. So by the subadditivity, of our outer measure mu star, we have that mu star of E is greater than or equal to mu star of E intersect A union B plus star of E intersect A complement intersect B complement. Let's just quickly explain where this came from. We have this equality here, and we are grouping these three together, because that's where you have your A intersect B, A intersect B complement, A intersect complement B, which can actually just be rewritten as A union B, and then the subadditivity allows us to, instead of equal, say it's greater than or equal to. So that's how we went from four terms down to two. And the A complement, B complement one over here is sort of just going to stay here. But I'm going to put these in little parentheses here. And you might ask, why'd you do that? Because A complement intersect B complement is actually the same as A union B complement. Now let's look at what we did here. I'm pretty excited. I hope you are as well. 
as you realize the absolute badass maneuver we just did. Sorry, when I get excited, I swear. Oh yeah, look at that. A union B, A union B compliment. That is what we were hoping for because now that means A union B is U measurable because remember to show U measurability, we only need to show this direction. And what does being U star measurable mean? It means it's in M. Booyah. All right, so we have shown that the union of two things is in M. And now, perhaps, you might understand why we decided to go the route of induction, because two things split up into these four terms. Now imagine you had an arbitrary N number of things, and you had to think of all the ways you compare them together like this. It would not be a good way to spend time. Okay, all right. So we've gotten that case done. And actually we can now very quickly from, now that we know that any two things, uh, their union is in M, any finite number of things union is also going to be in N or M immediately from induction. Because if you have, you know, if you know two things union together are in M and then you have, I don't know, a hundred things together and you union them together, then by induction, 99 of them would be an M, and then you're unioning one more thing. So we actually can conclude, although it's sort of an unnecessary step, M is an algebra, because we've now shown it's closed under finite unions. Bit of an unnecessary mid-step, but at least just to sort of mark off where we are, we've now shown we're closed under finite unions. Now we need to get to countable unions. So we will let some countable collection uh, be an M. And we're gonna define some new sets. We're going to let B sub N be the union up to N, so a finite union of them. And we're going to just let B without any subscript just be the full infinite union. Okay. And we may assume without loss of generality, we may assume without loss of generality that the AJ are disjoint. Now recall back to our sigma algebra lesson, the, the second lesson we showed that we can always let these be disjoint. So if you need to remember why that is, just recall the sigma algebra lesson or pull it up if you forgot that. We're allowed to assume they're disjoint. So arguing as before and with induction, And I'll sort of leave you to flesh out all the itty bitty details, but we can uh, we can get that for any e subset of x that mu star of e is going to be greater than or equal to the sum from one to n. of E intersect the AJ plus mu star of E intersect B complement. I'll sort of leave you as a small little exercise to figure that out. How did we get there? And then that's greater than or equal to mu star, again, j equals one to n, of this intersection of e with a j plus 
u star e intersect the complement. And what we're going to do now is let n go to infinity. So now we're going to let n go to infinity to get that mu star of e is greater than or equal to. So we're letting it go to infinity of mu star of e intersect these a j plus mu star of e intersect the complement, which is going to be greater than mu star of this infinite union of e intersect a j. Uh, still, I'll have to come down here to this line plus this other term here. Okay, but what's that going to end up equaling? Well, now since we have this infinite union here, this is going to just be E intersect B. Plus mu star of E intersect B complement. And that's greater than or equal to because this is the direction that comes for free with an outer measure, that's greater than or equal to just the measure, outer measure of E. So now look at this, we have the outer measure of E is greater than or equal to something is greater than or equal to the outer measure of E. So we actually get explicit equality. And what that means then is B is an N. I remember what was B? B was the full union. And that is now an element of M. So that gives us that we have that M is a sigma algebra. So last, let's scroll back up to the start of the theorem statement. So, okay, there we go. We've been at this for a while. So what did we have to do? First, we had to show it's a sigma algebra, and we're done with that. Now we have to show that mu star is a complete measure. That's actually not going to be so bad. We're just going to take a null set and show that uh, any subset of any null set, any subset of it is also going to be an M. So that means that it's going to be complete by definition. So if the outer measure of A is equal to zero, then since E intersect A obviously is going to be a subset of A, we have that mu star of E which we can write as this Okay, well, this one here is going to be zero. So now we just have mu star of E intersect A complement. And we know that that's going to be less, because E intersect A complement is a subset of E, that's going to be less than or equal to this. But then... There we go. We have that again, this, this is less than or equal to this. So we have that A is also in M because we get equality. Oops. So any set that has an outer measure of zero is also going to be an M. So we have that it's complete on M. Awesome. Okay, great. So we've shown that we have an outer measure that is complete and we've shown that M is a sigma algebra. Okay. All right, almost done. Just have one more definition, which will lead to two propositions, but we're just gonna state these propositions. So we talked about outer measures. We're also gonna have something called a pre-measure. So if 
Um, yeah, I hate to do this, but we're going to have to use fancy script A, not to be a set, but to be an algebra, because we're also going to use M later with A, so we need both of these, uh, is an algebra a pre-measure Sorry, that's from fancy A zero to infinity. And this pre-measure is mu sub naught. A pre-measure mu sub naught is a function such that one, as always, mu naught of the empty set is going to be zero. And two, if you have a collection of disjoint sets, so if you have a collection of disjoint sets in fancy A, our algebra, such that they're countable union. Now remember, an algebra doesn't guarantee that this is in it, but if this is in it, remember, a sigma algebra guarantees the countable union would be in it, the algebra doesn't. But if it is in it, then the pre-measure of the pre-measure of the union is explicitly equal to the sum of the pre-measure of each set. Now again, that's contingent upon if this countable union is in our algebra. Now, the word pre-measure should hopefully make us suspect this somehow will build up to a measure. Well, that's true. A pre-measure will induce an outer measure, and we saw that an outer measure gives us a sigma algebra and a complete measure. So pre-measures are sort of like the very basic. I'm not sure if you've um, experienced or recall much about topology, but you might remember in topology a thing called a sub-basis, and the sub-basis is like a very bare-bones thing, but you can build it up to a full topology. A pre-measure is sort of the same concept. With measure theory, it's a very bare-bones thing, but it can be built up into a measure. Um, so how do we do that? Well, a pre-measure induces an outer measure It induces an outer measure as follows. We will let u star of e equal the infimum the sum of the pre-measure on aj such that this set e is contained in this union of these aj. And it might seem very familiar to the definition we talked about at the start of the lecture. And it is, if you go back, you can see that this mu naught is sort of taking place of that row in that first definition. Now, granted, that row didn't have this condition two on it, but you can see that this will uh, take place of that. In fact, this mu naught is actually a little stronger than the row in our first definition. Um, but okay, so a pre-measure does in fact induce an outer measure, and we have two propositions here, and these won't be proven, we'll just state them, and I think that will be sufficient enough progress for today. If mu naught is a pre-measure on an algebra A, and mu star is as above. So I mean this, 
when I say as above, I mean it's that, it's the infimum of the sum of the pre-measures. Then one mu star restricted to the algebra A is just the pre-measure. So if you restrict the algebra, you get the pre-measure. Two, every set in the algebra is U star measurable. Okay, so this one is uh, just going to be a, a definition check on U star measurable. The first condition is fairly obvious. Um, it's not, I'm not omitting this because it's necessarily a hard proof. I'm just omitting it because it's not that the proof technique isn't really something that's going to be recurring in the future. And then the next proposition is that, uh, we will let a be some algebra. or we'll say an algebra. Mu not a pre-measure on A. And M, the sigma algebra generated by A. Then there exists a measure mu on M such that mu is equal to mu star restricted to M. So it's the outer measure uh, when you're dealing with just sets on M uh, and where mu star is given as above. So the same thing, it's the infimum of the pre-measures. And if nu, not mu, but nu is another such measure, then nu of each measurable set is less than or equal to mu of each set for all E in M with equality whenever mu is finite. Okay. So pre-measures are defined on algebras. The pre-measure induces an outer measure. And then if you take the pre-measure and the algebra it's defined on, that algebra generates a sigma algebra. And then we know we have a measure which is given by the pre the, the measure on the sigma algebra M is given by how the pre-measure on the algebra A is defined and what outer measure it defines. So we can take a pre-measure on an algebra A and we build that into an outer measure and A builds into a sigma algebra. And it just so happens to work out that that outer measure on this generated sigma algebra is in fact a measure. And it's almost unique because if you have another such measure, you will have equality on every finite set. But if the measure of E is infinite, it's possible the measure of V or nu might, uh, not be infinite, but as long as they're finite, you'll have equality. So that's how we can build pre-measures into measures. So that's pretty neat. Um, again, we won't prove this. Uh, in fact, we're almost never going to really mention pre-measures, but it is interesting nonetheless. Uh, outer measures are sort of what we're more interested in. And uh, going forward from here, next time, we'll start talking about how to build up some specific measures. In particular, we'll talk about how to build up into uh, the Lebesgue 
measure. We mentioned that before. Uh, let me uh, stop sharing here. Do, do, do. Okay, great, yeah. And then we're going to build into those uh, Lebesgue measure. And then after the next lecture, so the, the next lecture will be the last one where we focus purely on measures. And then after that, we're going to finally get into uh, measurable functions and start getting into integrating. So we'll start to get into that in a few more lectures. All right, with that, uh, thank you for watching and I will see you all next time.